Good evening and welcome. Uh, if you've not met me, my name is Bill Pearson. I rejoice in the title of Master of New College. Um, and with my wife here, uh, the beautiful Ruth, who's sitting in the front row, uh, we, I guess, at the end of the day, lead two remarkable communities here at the University of New South Wales, on behalf of whom I'd like to welcome you all, all warmly this evening especially if you're joining us for the first time. It's great to have you with us. We had a terrific t to get time together last night. Uh, we will rec release recorded versions of the lectures in due course. Let me begin by respect respectfully acknowledging the Bedigal people who are the traditional custodians of land on which this meeting takes place and to pay our respects to elders past and present. Last night I acknowledged our distinguished guests at our 2023 New College Lectures Tonight, again, I'd like to acknowledge my fellow trust trustees, the Right Reverend Dr. Michael Stead and Emeritus Professor David Cohen. I'd like to thank the entire New College team um, who've laboured to make the New College lectures a reality. Uh, many of them work unseen to you. Special thanks to Dr. Danny Scarrett and the Reverend Dr. A.J. Culp for their coordination of the lectures this year. And I'd like to thank the New College Board, especially the Chair, Mrs Janet Simpson, for their support of our work here. For some people, this will be their first time at New College, so special welcome to you, or be, you'll be viewing us via live stream. In brief, our we have two communities. The first is the present residence of this building, approximately 250 undergraduate students um, who hold a, an outstanding track record of academic achievement here at the University of New South Wales. We also have our postgraduate college across the road, New College Postgraduate Village, um, developing its own remarkable track record with over 100 doctorates awarded from the University of New South Wales. And we have approximately 700 alumni from our colleges. As well as being affiliated with the University of New South Wales, we're part of the Anglican Diocese here in Sydney. Um, and holding both of those special affiliations we run these present lectures as a, as a service to the community of Australia. We run a small research group called the Centre for Christian Apologetics, Scholarship and Education. Uh, Dr. Danny Scarrett and I are co-editors of a quarterly publication, um, which are available for inspection at our bookstore, which you can look at after the lectures. And there's a special deal to become a su subscriber. So I encourage you in that. At our bookstore also, there are many excellent books including those of our 2023 lecture, especially this number here, um, which is available for sale. As we experienced last night, questions are important to the New College lectures that make up part of a very exciting evening. If you turn your attention briefly to your left, my right, on that screen during the evening, there will scroll various important parts of pieces of information, including this particular screen here. So if you, if during, as Chris is speaking this evening and you want to ask a question, just send a message, just go to that website where you can submit a message or you can scan that code and it'll take you directly to the website. You can feed your questions in, they'll appear up here. We've been, this has been our practice for probably about five or six years now. It makes for a very efficient question time. Uh, as I say, we make these lectures available as, as um, service the community. Uh, one of the initiatives of the University of New South Wales is to have greater support for needy students at this university um, and part of our contribution is supporting students through scholarships. If you'd like to contribute to our student scholarships we greatly appreciate that of course. In terms of general housekeeping, if there's a fire alarm please head out that door. If you need to use our bathrooms they're over on this side of the building. By way of brief introduction, our speaker is Associate Professor Christopher Watkin. He is a future fellow of the Australian Research Council, the peak research granting body here in Australia. Being a future fellow is a distinguished and great for, greatly sought after position. Chris is at Monash University in the Monash State of Futures Institute. He specialises in European literature, theology, film and thought as well as English and, and American literature. He's act he has active ongoing research interests in the themes of religion, atheism, 
of secular philosophy and literature, liberation and emancipation from co across culture, and in philosophical understandings of the human being. He's the author of seven books, the most recent book being Biblical Critical Theory, which was launched here in Sydney at our postgraduate village at the end of last year. For those of us that were not with us last night, Chris began by coaching us in the core elements of critical theories, viability, visibility, and value. He then presented tensions between streams of contemporary views of society, principally between Hobbesian and, and Rousseauian schools of thought. He highlighted the strong references to biblical Christianity in these views, as well as broader critical theories. He showed how frames of reference are fundamental to a proper understanding of critical theories. He argued that the stereoscopic view of the Bible brings proper perspective, focus, and understanding of both people and society. So if you were not at the lecture last night, and you've not seen it, hopefully I've, I have um, encouraged you to go back and, and, and consume the material that we were presented with last night. If you don't mind, I'm going to pray briefly for us and I'm going to welcome our lecturer up. Dear Heavenly Father, as we meet here again this evening, we do thank you for the freedom we have in this country to discuss matters of belief and faith without fear. We pray for your blessing now upon our lecturer this evening that you grant him clarity of thought and expression. Please grant us all knowledge of you and a better understanding of you and your ways in this world. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Please welcome Associate Professor Christopher Watkin. Thank you, Bill. One thing I omitted to do last night that I want to make sure that I do tonight, so I'm going to do it first so I don't forget, is to thank you for coming along. Um, if you're anything like me, there are a lot of calls on your time you know, with busy people nowadays, uh, and no doubt there are many other things you could have chosen to do this evening rather than to come here and sit down for a while and, and engage with the, the thoughts that I'm going to be sharing. So thank you. Thank you for making time people here in the room. Thank you live streamy people for making time at uh, home. Um, I'm honored, uh, and I'm gonna do my best to make that time that you've, in a sense, given to me worthwhile. I wanna try and give you something back. Uh, and I want to uh, open up some ways of thinking about the modern world in relation to the Bible that I hope you will find um, fruitful, engaging, perhaps provocative, uh, interesting, and, and that you'll be able to go away thinking, well, of all the different things I could have done this evening, I'm, at least part of me is glad uh, that I, I chose to be. So if that's my, that's my aim, uh, you'll have to tell me at the end whether you think uh, I succeeded or not. Yesterday we were looking at the question of origins. Uh, where do human beings come from? What are the different stories we tell ourselves about where, how we began, who we fundamentally are uh, in, a, in a sort of originary sense? Tonight, I want to shift the focus to the present, and I want to think through with you about one of the great animating questions of our contemporary cultural moment. And I'd like to introduce that question to you by asking you a question. Uh, and the question is, what do the following people have in common? Uh, Spider-Man, Wonder Woman, Citizen Kane, uh, Hamlet, Captain Marvel, Luke Skywalker, and the list could go on. I, I think one of the things that the, the stories that are told of all of those people, what they have in common, is that the, the central to those stories is the question, who am I? Um, that their stories are told in a way to explore the, the identities of these people. And I suggest that it is one of the great animating questions of our society. Perhaps we're asking this question, who am I, more intensely and more deeply and, and more immediately than most societies have asked that question in the past. And so what I want to do this evening is tell a story 
about how this question is answered in, in our own late modernity, and then bring that story into conversation with what the Bible says in relation to this, this question, who am I? Now, the story that I want to tell is not the only story that could be told uh, about identity in late modernity. In fact, it, it stands alongside another story that's been told recently by um, the scholar theologian Carl Truman in his book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. So he tells a story, along with uh, Charles Taylor and others, uh, that goes by the name of expressive individualism. And he tries to show how our culture got to a point where this thing that is called expressive individualism characterizes the way we think about the self. I, I'm not going to tell that story this evening. I'm going to tell a story that sort of runs parallel to it, weaves in and out of it at points, starts a little bit further back, and, and I think is fundamental to understanding how we think about ourselves today. And, and by we, I mean the, the sort of society that, that we live in, Australian society today, by and large, thinks of identity in terms of, of this story. And it's a story not of expressive individualism, but of what's called possessive individualism. Um, for, for those of you who want to sort of chase these things up, it's, it comes from a book by a scholar called C.B. McPherson, and the title of his book is Possessive Individualism. So let's start our story in a small heated room uh, where a philosopher uh, is, well, first of all, keeping himself warm uh, in the cold Scandinavian uh, climate, and secondly, trying to think very hard about how to ground a sense of knowledge. And he reflects that the best cities that he's experienced are those that have been designed by one sole architect. He likes the, the, the harmony of those sort of planned cities. And so he tries to think about knowledge in the same way. Let's build it up from the ground, step by step. Uh, and uh, eventually, after about 4,000 words of writing, and presumably a few, a few logs on the fire as well, uh, he comes to this, what really has become an apocal moment in the development of modern philosophy, uh, where uh, he writes, I am thinking, therefore I exist, cogito ergo sum. Uh, across the, the philosophy in question is René Descartes. And um, among the many things that we could say about the cogito, and that have been said about the cogito, the one thing that I want to focus in on today is that it establishes in really quite a new way a sense of a bounded self. In other words, there's a hard barrier now between the self and the non-self. Uh, and the self is defined as that which is thinking and is, for Descartes, transparent to itself. In other words, I can be sure, for Descartes, that I'm thinking. There's absolutely no doubt about that whatsoever. And that's, that's the basis of certainty on which he built his whole edifice of knowledge. So what is on the subject side of the barrier, if you like, what what's belongs to the self is certain. I know with absolute undeniable certainty that I'm thinking. Because even if I doubt that I'm thinking, then I must think in order to doubt, and therefore I'm thinking. So that, that's his logic. What's outside the self is, is much more up for grabs. Um, he uh, wants to doubt everything hyperbolically, he says. My, my senses might be playing tricks on me. There might be some evil demon out there playing tricks on me. I can't be certain of what's out there in the world. What I can be certain of is my own thinking. And therefore, from this point on, you've got a sense of a demarcated self. Charles Taylor in the secular age calls it a buffered self. There's a very, a very stark difference now between me, myself, and everything else. And this, of course, is quite intuitive to us. We're probably sitting here thinking, well, isn't that just obvious? Um, but Taylor points out that previous to that, there was a much more porous sense of the self. Uh, so in the, the medieval period, for example, people would customarily think that they are sort of traversed by forces and powers and, and spiritual um, dynamics that, that really make the limits of the self very hard to draw. And so it, it is something new, according to Taylor, 
uh, that is being brought in by Descartes, this idea of the buffered self. There's now a fence, if you like, between what is me and what is not me. Move on about 50 years, uh, and I want to drop us next into the second treatise of government of John Locke. And what Locke does is he builds on this assumption that we can divide the self and the non-self, and he begins to talk about the self in terms of property. Now, for those of you who have read the second treatise, this will not surprise you because he talks about everything in terms of property. But one of the things he talks about in terms of property is the self. Let me read you what he says. Every man, which of course he's using gendered language, every man or woman, has a property in his own person. This nobody has any right to but himself. The labor of his body and the work of his hands, we may say, are properly his. So what's going on here? Well, the self is being understood as something that we own. You know, I own my laptop, I own my house, I own myself. It is a piece of property. And that opens up a set of possibilities for the self. So what, how do we think of property when, when we say something that is my property, what do we usually mean? Well, if it's my laptop, it means I decide what stickers get put on it. You can't tell me what to put on my laptop because it's mine. That's how it works. That's what it means for it to be mine. You can't come into my house and tell me how to decorate it. It's mine. I decide <laughs> how to decorate it. That's what it means for it to be mine. And so to inscribe the self in this logic of property begins to construct it as something over which we have dominion, if you like. It is something that I need to decide what to do with for myself, in the same way that I decide what to do with all the rest of my property. That is what it means for me to be mine, for it to be mine. Now, I want to leave Locke there, go back in time a little bit, and trace a parallel route that's going to converge with Locke eventually. So we're going to go right back even before Descartes, to the 15th century, the Florentine Renaissance. Uh, and we're going to consider for a moment the work of um, uh, Giovanni Pico de Lamirandola, and particularly one oration of his, a really famous oration, called Oration on the Dignity of Man. And in this speech, Pico is doing something really, really interesting with human identity. It's not unprecedented, you can trace it back to early church fathers Gregory of Nyssa, but he's doing it in a really aggressive way. And what he's trying to argue, and I'll read you the quote in a moment, is that human beings have no fixed or determined identity, uniquely among all of God's creatures. And we have the responsibility, if you like, of designing ourselves. Of, of working out for ourselves who we are and where we fit in reality. So let me read you uh, an extract uh, from Pico's oration. Um, it's written in the form of a dialogue, and, and this particular quotation is Pico imagining what God is saying to Adam after he's created Adam. Uh, so God says, We have given you, Adam, no fixed seat or form of your own, no talent particular to you alone, this we have done, so that whatever seat, whatever form, whatever talent you may judge desirable, the same may you have and possess according to your desire and judgment. Once defined, the nature of all other beings is constrained within the laws we have prescribed for them. But you, constrained by no limits, may determine your nature for yourself according to your own free will in whose hands we have placed you. So what's going on in this quotation back in the 15th century? Well, the self is becoming a project, isn't it? Uh, it's not something that's given to us. It is something that we must construct, something that we must make. And there, there's no rule book given to us. Um, you know, Adam is very expressly not constrained by any of the sorts of rules that are given to the other animals. He just needs to go and work it out for himself. You 
you know, so to speak. You do you, Adam. Um, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no rule book uh, for how you should be. And this idea of the self as a project and as something that is, is defined from within takes a, a, a register that previously was reserved for God and as, inscribes human beings within that register. So the self-defining one was, biblically speaking, God. It's God who says, I am who I am. I get to say who I am. I get to define who I am. And it's, it's this logic of self-definition that, that's being migrated over here to human beings. And for the longest time in our tradition, this was a very aristocratic privilege. So if you had the means and the leisure and the inclination, uh, you could work out and cultivate a particular identity for yourself. Um, so Pico himself um, was uh, noble. Uh, one important example of this from the 18th century would be the, the Marquis de Sade, who very expressly sought to cultivate a particular sense and expression of self for himself, and had the means to do so because he was uh, part of the aristocracy. The interesting thing, one of the interesting things about this, is that in the 20th century, this logic of self-definition becomes democratized. Uh, it's no longer the preserve of the aristocracy alone, um, but everybody is now inscribed within this story that we need to define for ourselves who we are, define our sense of, uh, of what the meaning of life is uh, for ourselves, and, and to make ourselves, if you like, from within. And where that leaves us is with a, a, a view of the self that is today, how would you put it? It's commoditized, I guess, um, marketized. So the, the idea of the constructed self becomes part of the logic of the market that governs so much of our um, society today. And my identity becomes something not only that I curate for myself, but something that I, if you like, sell, something that I need to, to market for myself. And this is not only the case sort of very obviously online, where the way that I present myself can either garner likes or on some platforms financial reward or, or not. That's a sort of very obvious tip of the iceberg. But, but that's indicative of something that's happening more broadly in society, that there is a market for identities today. Uh, and each of us are, if you like, presenting ourselves as, as our identities as commodities to be bought and sold and negotiated and so forth. Now, I'm going to go into that a little bit more uh, later uh, in the lecture. Uh, I want to read you a quote from the legal theorist Janice uh, Richardson, um, who uh, in a, a, one of her books tries to unpick this dynamic of the commoditization and the marketization of identity. And she writes this, we are called upon each to view ourselves as an enterprise, which involves working upon ourselves to increase our, quotes, human capital. Um, and in a sense, it doesn't really matter what identity you offer to the market, that the market always wins, always incorporates every uh, identity that you might choose to, um, to float. So there's this story then of um, possessive individualism, which in the 20th century has become the, the marketization, the personal branding of identity. And th there's a sense in which we, we can't escape this. To, to seek to refuse to do that becomes a position within the market itself. It's what Peter Berger, the sociologist, calls the heretical imperative. So the root of the term heretical means to choose. Um, and his point with the heretical imperative is even if you're an orthodox believer today, you've chosen to be an orthodox believer. In other words, you cannot not choose. The choice not to choose is a choice. Like you can't get out of having to choose today. That's the society we live in. And so the heretical imperative of identity is even if you say, 
I'm not going to be any part of this, this market for identity. I'm not going to sort of curate myself in that way. That, that itself becomes a market option. That becomes one thing you can do with your identity. So there's no, there's no extracting yourself from this logic of marketized identity today. So where does that leave us? It leaves us, I suggest, with three broad identity options available to us today. The first one uh, we might call a sort of broad, dominant market identity. It, it's sort of the default option today. Uh, and in this first option, we build ourselves according to the symbols and meanings that are readily presented to us in society. The, the different brands of clothing, the different advertisements that we see all around. We, we curate a, a cluster of these and we express our identity in terms of this cluster of symbols that we've picked from the, the shelves uh, of the superstars uh, in our, our particular area. Um, and this leads, I think, to a see if this works tonight, to an ironic uh, position. Here we go. Um, and it's an irony that I found nowhere as crisply captured as in this advert behind me. Um, I, I saw an advert very similar to this one day, walking home from work, and I couldn't find the exact one, but this is the closest I've got. It's the same strap line but it was um, just one, one of these pictures on it. It's an advert for the General Pant Company. I've got nothing against the General Pant Company. Um, it, I'm sure that they make very fine garments. I've never worn any of them myself. It's just that this is a very clear example of something that's much broader. So there's, there, this is not, I'm not picking on them. <laughs> Anyone who works for the General Pant Company here, you're great, keep going. I'm not picking on the, the advertising company that made this either. It's, it's indicative of a trend that's much, much broader. Uh, but it's really crisp here. So what's the message? Let's try and pick apart what this advert is, is saying to us. Uh, we are Gen P led by none. I think there are two messages here. The first one uh, in this first line, we are Gen P, um, is the message of community, isn't it? There is a we here. Um, I am part of a, a group of people, a tribe, we might say, in society, um, who identify in a particular way. I belong, in other words. There's a we. I'm part of something bigger than myself. Uh, so we are Gen P, and of course it's, it's playing on the, the general pant company, but also Generation X, Generation Y, you know, we are Gen P. There's a, we have an identity. We are a generation. Uh, and the second line here, led by none, is, is emphasizing individuality, isn't it? We're our own people. We, we make ourselves. Nobody tells us what to do. Uh, we are, you know, the captains of our own ships, so to speak. And so to, to make explicit what is implicit in this advert, what, what are we being told? Uh, well, we're being told, if you want to belong to Gen P, and if you want to be someone who nobody tells what to do, uh, then could we please tell you to buy our garment? <laughs> because if you wear General Pant Company apparel, uh, then you will know that you are led by no one, uh, and you are part of this wonderful community. And we, we sort of titter, don't we? But there's a sense in which we buy that sort of message. Like, the, the reason, it works, doesn't it? You know, they wouldn't spend money on it, and other companies wouldn't spend money on it if it didn't work. <laughs> so people like you and me respond to, to this sort of advert, and, and other different types of advert. Um, but, but we, so what I'm saying is I don't want the, the stupidity of it when it's expressed in very explicit terms to, to blind us to the fact that, that we, we're not standing outside this whole system looking in from the outside. We are implicated in this sort of dynamic as well, in, in one way or another. And, and this is therefore the, the dominant sort of ethic of commoditized individuality today. You buy 
yourself, you buy your individuality in, in this sort of way, um, and you, you exteriorize, you symbolize the fact that you're your own person by the sort of clothes that you wear, and you buy the, the brand identity that then helps you to construct yourself and to display that self uh, to the rest of the world. And the, the irony of that, of course, um, and I think it is, it is an irony that should evoke pathos in us, and, and there, is a, there is a sort of clownishness to it, but I think underneath that clownishness there's, there's a deep, somber sadness to it as well, and I want us to see both of those. It's that it becomes impossible to tell the difference between two things, I think, within this dynamic. It's impossible to tell the difference between this, which is someone saying to themselves, I will forge my own way in life, I will go my own way, and this, uh, the, an ambient cultural message that says you should want to go your own way, and the person appropriating that and thinking that that is their, their own idea. Think of it this way. If we went back in time, say, to 1914-15 uh, in, in England, uh, where the ethic of doing one's duty is very prominent in society, think of all those um, sort of posters in the First World War, your country needs you, that sort of thing, do your duty. Um, and we went up with a, a microphone, we wouldn't have a microphone back then, we had the, the scribe with a tablet or something, um, to someone in the street and said, do you want to do your duty? And the person would say, of course I want to do my duty. And we would say to them, is that your idea? They say, yes, with every fiber of my being, I want to do my duty. Um, we would perhaps be within our rights to say to them, well, of course you do because that's what your society is telling you a hundred times a day and everywhere you look. So how could you possibly not want to do your duty? Uh, come forward to our own age, we do the same thing in the streets of Sydney, and we walk up to someone and we say, do you want to go your own way? I say, of course I want to go my own way. I don't want them telling me what to do. I don't want to be, you know, part of someone else's story. I want to, to forge my own way. I, I want to to make my own path in life. Um, and similarly, we say, is that something you want? Yes, of course it is. With every fiber of my being, that is what I want. Um, well, in the same way that for someone in a society of duty, we might be within our rights to say, well, I, I wonder whether that really is your idea, actually, or whether it's just what your society has catechized you into thinking since you were born. Uh, uh, similarly with today's society, I, I think for us, who are part of that, breathing the air of this society. It is impossible for us, with absolute transparency, to tell whether the ideas that we have about creating ourselves and going our own way are actually our ideas. Uh, I, I, I don't think we have that self-transparency, that absolute self-transparency, that, that can distinguish between the ideas that have simply been the air that we've breathed ever since we've been born, and what is genuinely our own spontaneous desire. And so there's this, this pathos of identity formation through market acquisition, uh, which is that it, it is sold to me and to you as something radically individual, led by none. Um, but there's always the lingering suspicion uh, that behind that, uh, there's other interests being served by us thinking that it is us who is making this decision. We are forging our own identity. Nobody's telling me what to do. Uh, we can never completely exorcise the ghost of that lingering, disturbing uh, possibility in our society. So that's the first way of constructing identity, the dominant sort of leading brand market way of thinking about ourselves today. Uh, but of course, people like you and me, we don't fall for that, do we? Goodness me, no. No, we wouldn't be seen wearing the latest brand. It's far too, um, far too crass. Um, we construct our identity uh, not from the off-the-peg range of dominant identity options, but from the off-the-peg range of alternative identity options. The indie logic of constructing identity 
uh, whether it's, I'm going to embarrass myself by using totally out of date terms, but I'm just going to do it anyway. So just smile at me if you know that this is out of date. Whether we sort of construct an, an emo identity or a goth identity, or if you're someone like me, uh, ever so slightly eccentric academic identity, it's, it's the same logic. Like we think that we're not falling for it because we don't wear general pant company apparel. You know, we don't wear the big brands, the Nikes and the Adidas or whatever it is. Um, but we are fooling ourselves if we think we are not participating in this same logic. You know, the way that we comb our hair, whether we have a beard or not, if we're a man, the sort of clothes we wear. Yeah, I am sending off messages, aren't I, standing up here. I could have dressed in any number of ways and chose to dress this way. There are reasons for that. There are identity signals that I'm necessarily sending off through doing it that way. And so are you as I look out at all you wonderful people uh, sitting here in the audience, we cannot escape this logic. Uh, and so we, we find ourselves, should we think we are outside this system, uh, rather like um, these guys here. Uh, hey guys, get a load of this conformist, say all the radical non-conformists. You can't escape this logic simply by not being part of the dominant set of style symbols, uh, because the, the indie and, and the alternative array of style symbols are equally indicative of, of this way of being. I, I haven't seen this expressed anywhere, I think, more powerfully, more disturbingly, than in an episode of Black Mirror that many of you may have seen called 15 Million Merits. And the, the lead character in this um, episode is sort of caught in, in some sort of society where you have to earn merit by sort of exercising on bikes and doing good things, throwing your litter away and so forth. And if you, if you gain 15 million merits, you're allowed to go on this sort of television talent show. Um, and this seems to be what everyone aspires to in this episode. Uh, and the lead character, the male character, is called Bing. Um, and he's horrified when his uh, girlfriend gains enough merit, you know, thinks all her Christmases have come at once, goes on this show, and, and is commoditized, commoditized and sold as a porn star, you know, much to her surprise. But then she sort of feels her way into that role, and the audience love it, and, and she is sold in that way, and he's horrified by this. What is this system doing to people? So he works hard and does his exercising and throws his litter away and finally gets his 50 million merits so that he can appear on this talent show as well. Uh, and when he does, what he does is he's standing before this you know, sort of audience that are waiting with bated breath to see what he does. And he pulls a shard of glass out of his um, pocket, holds it to his neck, uh, and uh, launches into a, 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 a tirade against the system. He said, you know, don't you dare cut me or I'll kill myself. Let me tell you about this terrible system. Let me tell you what it did to my girlfriend. Now, this is the interesting moment. The audience love it. They're lapping it up. This is wonderful. And there, then, after that, he gets a weekly slot on this television channel where he rages against the machine to his heart's content, uh, and the ratings go up. So what's happened? His, his rejection of the system has been commoditized as part of the system. His very rejection of the values of the system has been co-opted. That's what this system does. You try and resist it, your resistance becomes an option, becomes an option of self-cultivation. You see, it's very hard to, to stand outside this system because any attempt to do so becomes another identity option in the portfolio of identity options that are open to us in this moment of heretical imperative in which we find ourselves. So that's the second option that's open to us, but it's vanishingly close to the first. It's the, the indie, the alternative sense of I'm not going to be sucked in to this sort of brand identity construction matrix, uh, which people like me, and I'm guessing many people in this room, will be more drawn to than the, than the dominant way of forming identity. But let us not be naive to think that, therefore, we are standing outside this system. 
So those are your first two options. There, there's the, the dominant sort of leading brand way of constructing an identity. There's the alternative, the indie, the I don't want anything to do with that, I'm going to wear my tweed jacket way of constructing an identity. And the, the third narrative that is open to us, I think, today, is one that, that is just utterly disorientated in relation to identity. Um, that, that doesn't know what to do, that, that in a sense despairs of having an identity. And, and this too, I think, is still caught in the orbit of possessive individualism because what, what this particular position says or thinks to itself is that I cannot adequately or authentically construct an identity on these terms. I can't just buy a, a set of clothes and then become the type of person that is presented in the, the adverts for those clothes. It, it just, I can't see myself doing that. And therefore, I have no identity on the market. I look at all these you know, wonderful, beautiful people on Instagram or wherever, and they've all got these incredible brands, these incredible identities, and I just don't. And I can't see how I could possibly have one. And, and there's, a, there's a paralysis, there's a, a sense of, of, of weightiness of not being able to authentically or, or sufficiently participate in this logic. Um, but it, if you'll notice, this is still controlled by the logic of possessive individualism because what is being rejected or denied is precisely this mode of constructing identity. I can't do it this way, therefore I can't be part of it at all. Um, therefore I'm just going to withdraw. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try and, and, and sort of hide away from having an identity. Um, and, I, and I think that is um, a real position of, of great angst and, and, and trouble that, that a lot of people find themselves in today. So those are your three options. Uh, there, there may be nuances, there may be others, but I think those are three dominant ones today. So what I'd like to do for the rest of the time is to uh, crack open a, a Bible with you uh, and to think if we were to try and generate responses to these same sorts of questions from the texts of the Bible, what sort of answers would we come up with to the question, who am I? If we let the Bible, in a sense, set its own table, uh, not impose on it a, a cultural matrix of what we think identity should look like, but just let it come out of the pages of the Bible too, as what sort of construction of identity would, would we find? Um, I'm going to use, and I'm really sorry about this, a, a very ugly term to describe what I think is a very beautiful reality in the Bible. Uh, I just can't find a simpler term. And if you can, please come up to me afterwards and tell me what it should be, and I'll start using yours instead of mine, because mine is really clunky. Um, I, I'm going to try and unfold from the Bible a picture of what I'm calling um, eschatologico doxological dispossession. So there you go. That's your, that's your catchy title for this evening. Go home and say, what were you listening? I was listening to a uh, lecture about eschatological doxological. Oh, right, okay, well, fair enough. Um, but that's, that's the best I can do at the moment because I think each of those terms is doing some really important work in relation to the way that, that, that the Bible presents uh, identity to us. So let's just take them one at a time. And I want to begin with um, dispossession, which, of course, is a very stark contrast to the logic of possessive individualism. So I'm starting to um, argue that there's, there's a, a really radical disjunction between modern possessive individualism and the way in which the, the Bible constructs responses to the question, who am I? Let me uh, read you a couple of uh, verses to begin with. Um, so uh, Jesus in uh, Mark and Luke and Matthew uh, has variations on this uh, saying, uh, and this is from Mark 8.35. Uh, for whoever wants to save their life, and the word for life there is, is psyche, the, the, the soul, the self, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What's going on here? Well, uh, there's, there's a sense of paradox, isn't there? Uh, it, it, it's a, a strange way for the self to operate 
uh, whoever loses their self um, for Jesus and for the gospel will end up, if, if Jesus is correct, saving their self. And whoever seeks to hold on to their self, uh, which in many ways is what precisely what possessive individualism is, is demarcating and, and holding on to the self as a possession. Whoever wants to do that, Jesus is suggesting, will end up losing their self. So we're beginning to see a sense of selfhood here that is articulated not around possession, not a sense of locking down myself and understanding it and, and guarding it and cultivating it, but, but a sense of self that is gained by in some way losing the self, giving the self up in order for it to be returned, um, which is be already, just from this first quotation, very countercultural to us today. Uh, this, this is not a message that will sit comfortably uh, with late modern paradigms of identity formation. Let me carry on. Uh, Galatians 2, verse 20, uh, Paul writes the following. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Hold on, Paul. So you no longer live. Yes, that's right. But the life you now live, you live. Yes, that's right. And so the, the logic here is, is that the, Paul's sense of self is passing through the same stages of death and resurrection that Jesus Christ himself endured. There's a sense in which the self dies, one, Paul dies to himself, and is reborn in a way that's inextricably entwined with the identity of Jesus, if you remember from that quote, the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. There's a, there's a, an, a rich inextricability now to who Paul is and who Christ is. Those two can't be, be pulled apart anymore. And again, this is breaking open those, those barriers of the self. Again, the, the, the strict wall between me and not me is being transgressed and traversed here. So is it me or is it Christ? Yes, said Paul, it certainly is. Um, and then again, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Uh, so again, uh, the, the self is reaching beyond itself for its reference. And, and this is not just in Paul, is it? It's, it's all through the Bible. So in Genesis 1 that we were talking about last night, um, human beings are made in the image of God. In other words, in order to understand who human beings are, you, you need to look beyond human beings to the God of whose image they are. It's not a self-contained property, if you like, of identity. It's always dispossessed of itself. It's always got its front gate, if you like, wide open, um, and it's, it's open to the outside, and in this case specifically uh, to God. Um, and therefore, I think, see what you think of this. I, I think this is right. The, the key question in terms of identity in the New Testament is not who am I, but Jesus' question to his disciples, who do you say I am? And, and it's this sense of us coming to a knowledge of the self via the other, uh, via understanding who Christ is for us and in us, as Paul says, you know, I, was, I died with Christ and, and so forth. It's, it's, a, it's a logic of the self that, that weaves into, that loops into itself, a, a knowledge of the other, specifically uh, of Christ. So that's the uh, dispossession part of identity. Um, but it's not just a sort of generic dispossession. I don't think it's just sort of a generic relation to, to otherness. I think it has a particular quality to it. And specifically, it's a, a doxological dispossession um, in the sense of the way that, that the self finds itself is in going outside itself in praise to God. So, for example, the psalmists uh, often come to a sense of, of who they are and where they sit in the world as they, they find 
themselves praising God. So the, the psalm will start with a, a problem, a predicament. The psalmist will praise God, and then the psalmist will understand themselves and their situation better. And the, this logic of doxological disposition, which, if you're interested, is a term used by Michael Hanby in his book, Augustine and Modernity, is right at the heart of Augustine's confessions. It's usually sort of spoken of, customarily spoken of, as the first autobiography of the Western tradition. It's the, the beginnings of the genre of autobiography. But it doesn't read like a normal autobiography today. Let me just read you the opening lines of uh, Augustine's confessions. Um, you are great, Lord, and highly to be praised, quoting Psalm 47. Great is your power, and your wisdom is immeasurable, quoting Psalm 146. So, so what is Augustine doing here? He's finding himself by going outside of himself in praise, in doxology, to God. Um, and there's a, there's a really interesting passage in the Confessions that, that for me, was the penny drop moment here. Um, now, this really resonates with me. It may or may not with you. you. You have to see as I read it. But I find this um, incredibly helpful, this moment in the Confessions. Augustine writes, I am scattered. So he's talking about himself. He looks in himself, and, and he basically says, I'm all over the place. I'm a mess. I am scattered in times whose order I do not understand. The storms of incoherent events tear to pieces my thoughts. And then he goes on to say, it's by looking to God that this scatteredness is, is gathered together. Um, and the sense here is, if I, if I simply look inside myself and try to make sense of the the cauldron of all my different desires and impulses and, and loves and, and everything that's, that's in here, I, I don't find coherence. Um, I, I find clashes and tensions and differences. And on one day, I'm feeling this way. And then I wake up on the next day, and I'm feeling very different. And some days, I'm incredibly bitter. And I could go and punch someone. And then the next day, I'm all sweetness and light. And I love everyone. It, I just don't make sense within myself. Uh, that there is no internal coherence. And Augustine is saying, I do find coherence, however, when I look away from this knotted ball of wool inside of me towards God. Uh, and it's by, by, in a sense, forgetting myself and losing myself in praise of God that I find who I am, not by looking inside myself. Uh, and that's what, what Hanby argues is Augustine's doxological dispossession. So I don't, I don't try to gather myself. I don't try to possess and demarcate myself as a way to finding my identity. I actually actively look away from the complexity of myself and find myself gathered as I reach beyond myself uh, towards uh, God, uh, who, who makes sense of me. It's, it's a little bit like um, that wise advice of, of most parents teaching their children to ride a bike for the first time. Don't look at the ground right under your feet. Try and look at something on the horizon. Fix your eyes ahead, and then you'll be able to keep your balance. But if you look right down where you are, you'll probably fall over. Uh, and the, the sense here for Augustine is, is don't, don't fixate on the, the complexity of feelings and impulses and desires in you, because you won't end up making coherent sense of those. Look outside yourself to God, uh, and you will find yourself uh, cohering around that doxological relationship uh, of dispossession. Um, finally, this relationship is not only doxological, I, I think it's also necessarily eschatological in the sense in which Christian identity is not only decentered in terms of I can't understand myself apart from God, it's also decentered temporally. So my identity is a story, and the story hasn't finished yet. I'm in the middle chapters. And the, like any story in the middle chapters, there's sort of a sense of how it might be and where it's going, but you don't really know yet what sort of story it is. Uh, you, you don't know how it's going to end. So for example, again, uh, Colossians 3, uh, verses 3 to 4. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And so the sense of, of current 
hiddenness, future manifestation. It's, it's not clear yet. It's not all there yet, um, but it will be in the future, in the eschaton. So that's this sense of eschatological identity. Uh, or 1 John 3, verse 2. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Uh, again, who you are cannot be condensed into the present. It, it is part of a story that overflows the present. And this is one of the ways in which a biblical concept of identity, I think, cannot be commodified, cannot become part of this market negotiation of identities. Because you can't, in order for the possessive individualism to work, you need something like the Cartesian self. You, you need a product with boundaries. But in time and again, what this Christian sense of identity is doing is, is it's transgressing all boundaries, the boundary of self and other, the boundary of now and not yet. So you can't package it. You can't package the, the Perusia or the Eschaton. You can't sell it. I mean, Christians have tried to, don't get me wrong, um, but it's, it's constitutively impossible to do. Uh, this, this way of thinking about identity resists commoditization, I think, in quite an aggressive way. Um, so one, one final quote here, uh, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. Uh, and we all, with unveiled face, behold, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. So there's a sense here that identity is a process. Who I am is, is a becoming. It's not a being, a static being. In the present, I am on my way to being something, not there yet, and therefore my my the fullness of my identity cannot be possessed in the present yet, uh, and so it's decentered temporarily, uh, as well as being decentered by by going outside of itself in praise to God. So, bringing these threads to a close, what are we left with? I think one thing we're left with is a sense of Christian identity. That, that navigates the, the twin pitfalls of self-assertion um, and self-abnegation that, that we find the logic of possessive individualism sort of yo-yos between. So there, there's either a sense of, I must at all costs curate an attractive, commercializable, finished identity, and have others affirm that by liking it literally online or, or by, by liking it more sort of organically uh, in life, uh, and that is how I know that I, I am somebody, or I'm nobody. Uh, and I think the, the biblical view of identity allows us to fall into neither of those um, traps, really. Um, and one of them, the, the, the sort of the logic of self-assertion, um, reframed in biblical language, would be something like, um, the one who wants to save their life will save it. It's a very linear understanding of self-assertion leading to a concrete self-transparent identity. Uh, and the self-abnegation would be the one uh, who loses their life will lose it. Um, you know, if you're not in the game, if you're not presenting an attractive identity proposition to people, then you're, where are you? You're nobody. Um, but of course, the, the biblical logic, as we've already seen, is that the one who wants to save their life will lose it, and the one who loses their life, but notice, notice a little clause in that verse. It's not simply the one who loses their life will save it. It's the one who loses their life, Jesus says, for me and for the gospel will save it. So again, it's this looping into identity of, of another that becomes inextricable and constitutive of our sense of who we are. And this depossession of possessive individualism, that's key to, to navigating um, these, uh, these waters uh, of either bald self-assertion uh, or, um, or self-negation. Um, I think another consequence, I I feel it this way anyway, you, you have to see what you think. 
of this Christian way of, of thinking about identity is it gives you, so to speak, space to breathe in the sense that I don't need to become transparent to myself right now. I, I can sit with the complexity of all my different desires and impulses and, and hopes and fears and them not making sense and them being a bit of a mess, quite frankly. Um, probably shared too much there. But, <laughs> but in a sense, that's okay because God hasn't finished with me yet. I don't need to know who I am in some sort of final etched in stone sort of way now because this is part of a process. And therefore, I've got space to breathe in terms of my identity. I, I don't feel compelled to present some sort of finished product to, to this commoditized market of identity options in order to be somebody, to be on my way to being somebody. Um, I, I just find that incredibly refreshing, uh, that sort of space to breathe in terms of, of working out who on earth we are. Um, and so four quick points to conclude. This sense of Christian identity, I find, is first of all democratic in the sense that it's not an identity that is either reliant on um, the, the privilege of aristocracy. So thinking back to you know, the Marquis de Sade and the fact that he was able to construct an identity because he had the, the leisure time and so forth to do so. Or it's not beholden to, to the logic of consumption either. Um, you know, so the General Pant Company and many other companies like them create a price point for these products that excludes some from the market necessarily. It becomes a privilege to be able to buy the things that construct a particular identity. That's engineered into the construction of identities, and therefore it becomes unavailable to, for example, many um, people in majority world countries who just don't have the affluence or the access to those sort of identity signifiers uh, that we do, but not Christian identity. Uh, Christian identity doesn't require a, a bank account of a particular uh, level, it doesn't require privilege, it doesn't require discretionary time. Um, it is, in that sense, radically democratic. It is open to, to everybody. Uh, there's no price point that prices some people out uh, of the market. Secondly, uh, Christian identity, I think, is, is subversive in the sense that it exposes the reality of possessive individualism, the possessive individualism, I think, would rather we didn't think too much about. Uh, it, it sort of exposes the, the, the ripple of laughter that there was as I was trying to make explicit what's implicit in that uh, advert for the General Pant Company. It, it does, in a sense, what the Book of Revelation does to the city of Babylon. It shows you the ugly underbelly, the part that's hidden from you. You know, the fact that the people who sew those garments don't have access to those identity options themselves. That, that's an uncomfortable truth. That, the, the system, again, not picking on this company, the system in general would rather keep from us because it undermines the message of these sort of aspirational identity options for us. So it's um, democratic, it's subversive, it's, it's exhilarating, I think, the, the Christian approach to identity because I find that my identity is inextricably tied up with the God who made the stars and the universe. That's, that's pretty big. That's pretty open, but also the God who I cannot control. Um, as uh, Mrs. Beaver says of Aslan in the, uh, the first Narnia book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he's good, but he's not safe. Um, and to, to have my identity inextricably tied to one who is good, but not safe, um, is a bit of a roller coaster ride. I'm never quite sure what he's going to demand of me, where he's going to take me. Um, and that is um, frightening in mo certain moments, but also extremely exhilarating. Uh, it, it, it isn't an identity that's locked into what Malcolm Muggeridge called the, the sort of damp, dark cell of its own ego. Uh, it's not an identity that, that, that simply looks inside and the, the extent of its kingdom is, is this inner world. It is an identity that is open to an outside world that is infinite because God is infinite, but that doesn't make it safe. <laughs> that's, that's not a, a nice, comfortable reality, simply. It's an exhilarating reality. Um, and the final thing that Christian identity is, I think, is uh, liberating, uh, because it gives us a genuine alternative 
uh, to the inexorable logic of commoditized market identities that, as I was trying to argue earlier, are extremely good at co-opting resistance to them into their own logic. Think of Bing and 50 million merits. Again, it's so hard to extract yourself from this logic of self-curation and market self-presentation. And, and I think that the, the biblical model does provide a genuine way to do that because, as I was saying earlier, the, the way in which Christian identity systematically reaches beyond itself and blurs the boundaries of the self, as, as Paul writes, so caught up with Christ that, that it's almost impossible to tell the difference between the life that he now lives and, and, and Christ's life now. That, that cannot be packaged if, if we understand it and we fully embrace it, um, which, which is, I think, just incredibly liberating uh, and refreshing for Christians today. So those are my reflections uh, and I, I hope uh, biblical reflections uh, on uh, identity formation uh, from a biblical point of view. Um, and I would love to hear what you guys think about it through the questions. So now over to you. Our first question this evening comes from Luke. How would you try to communicate the great beauty of self-denial for the sake of Christ to somebody else who is sceptical about handing over the reins of self to another? Um, I think I would say that self-denial isn't the whole story. So I think you'd want the whole sort of pattern of that, that saying of Jesus, you know, the one who saves their life will lose it, and the one who loses their life for, for me in the gospel will save it. So it, it's not simply, I want to renounce myself in some absolute and final way, and there's something strangely good in that denial in and of itself. I, I think it's, it's partly the, the idea that through letting go of the self as a possession, and through, through that risk, and, and it is, I think, a, a moment of of destabilization and uncertainty. So I wouldn't want to water that down for the person. This is, you know, again, this is not safe. This is not something where we can retain control. It, it is, by definition, a letting go of control of ourselves. And that is, that is scary. That is not a, not a safe moment. But if we're willing to trust Jesus with that, and, you know, there's, there's a whole backstory, you, you don't suddenly wake up one morning knowing nothing about Jesus, I'm going to trust him. You know, there's a, there's a coming to terms with the Christ of the Scriptures over time and a, a, a growing sense of this is someone I think I, I can trust. So, you know, there's, there's a whole backstory to that. But when we get to that point, there's a sense of, okay, I am going to take him at his word, let go of myself, um, and deny myself in that sense um, in the expectation that what he says is true, uh, and that those who lose their life for, for him and for the gospel will, will save it. Um, so it's not just self-denial. There's, there's an irreducible moment of self-denial, and we shouldn't, be, shouldn't try to airbrush that out, um, but it's not simply, oh, I want to make myself nothing and just for the sake of being nothing because it's good to be nothing. You know, that, that would be some sort of masochistic self-denial. It's not that. It's the, the way to, there's an image in 1 Corinthians 15, I'll finish with this, um, that the, the body that's sown perishable is raised imperishable. You put a seed in the ground, the seed dies, doesn't it? Uh, and then you get the, the wonderful oak tree or whatever it is sprouting up. And there's a sense in which the, that, that decay of the seed is necessary for the, the greater thing to come forth. You know, if we're holding on to our own identity, um, with such jealousy that, that we're not going to let anyone anywhere near it, then we, in a sense, holding on to that seed. Um, and it's, it's only when we, we let it die that the, the greater thing, the magnificent oak tree or, or whatever it is, um, comes forth. So self-denial is part of a bigger story. It's not the whole, it's not the whole story. Thank you. Uh, just background for this next question. It mentions Psalm 139, which talks about how 
um, even before the psalmist came into being, that God had a knowledge of who they are. Um, so just, just a, Chris might want to pick up that in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, from Deb, does Psalm 139 imply that we have a possessible identity in God that is preordained? I, I don't create, I don't curate my Christian identity, it exists and I become truly me as Christ lives in me. To the extent that I try to be Christian, I'll not truly be the me that I will be in the new creation. This is getting to be a long question. But on this side of the new creation, the fruit of my identity will flourish as I abide in the vine of Christ. But more biblical language. In short, does Psalm 139 imply a preordained, unique, but nonetheless increasingly available identity in Christ? Wow, what an interesting question that is. Um, look, let's start with the psalm and work out from there and see where we get. So it's, it's that psalm that will be familiar to many of us. You've searched me, O Lord, you know me. You know when I sit, when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. So it's, it's a sense of being, um, being seen, uh, to use language that, that resonates today, by God, that God knows me. And I, I think the, the first thing to draw attention to there is that, that the dynamic of knowledge of self, often in the Bible, is not that I know myself, but that God knows me. I am known, if you like. Um, I think that's really interesting in terms of identity because what it saves you from is either the an utter chaos of identity, that there's nothing here, nothing is known. There's just this flux of different sort of impulses and so forth, and, and there is no sense being made of it. Or the sense that I have to become utterly transparent to myself in order to have any identity at all. Um, so if I am known by God, there is, if you like, a, a me, there is a coherent me, even if I do not know what it is or can't make sense of myself in the present. And so therefore there's something to hold on to in the midst of all the flux, and I don't have to make sense of that flux in order to, to know that I am somebody, if you like. And I think that's a really subtle dynamic that if there isn't someone like God outside of me with authority who knows me it's very hard to to get that you either have to have I'm transparent to myself or I'm I'm just a mess there's there's no rhyme or reason uh, to me um and so what remind me of the question I was going to say something from Revelation I think that's uh, Psalm 39, possessible identity in God that's preordained. Um, I, I, it's really interesting. I, I, don't, I don't know that I would use the language of possessible identity in God um, for the reasons that I was describing. It seems that the, the, the Bible is systematically pushing back against the idea of identity as property. Um, so if you think about Revelation, there's the idea that the, the, um, the people are given a name from God. So identity is a gift there. It's something that's bestowed again. It's something that inextricably folds the other into itself. And I think, I think that disrupts the logic of possession, which requires something like the, the bounded self of Descartes. So I think I agree with the spirit of the question, but I, I, I wouldn't use, and the question does put it in quotation marks, so I wouldn't use that language of possessible identity. Um, I'd use a, a language of um, sort of real, perhaps authentic identity, um, but, but not the language of possession. Thank you. I can see people on the tram tonight rapping to eschatological, dis doxological disposition <laughs> this evening on the way home. Well, they're better um, people than I am. <laughs> uh, from Jonathan, how much is the process of eschatological, do dox doxological disposition linked to or synonymous with the process of sanctification? Ooh. Um, you may want to explain what sanctification is. Well, um, there are different understandings of what sanctification is, and indeed I was discussing them with a friend who knows much more about this than I do, and is also in the room uh, earlier today. Um, so I, I feel um, quite ill-equipped uh, to answer this question, but let me have a go anyway. Um, that sanctification is the idea that we are made holy by Christ. 
uh, that, um, that we grow in Christ's likeness over time. Um, and I, I think there is a, a significant overlap between that process of, of Christ, you know, as, as the Bible says, Christ in me, the hope of glory, and the sense of becoming who we are uh, in Christ. Um, and so I, I would say, I, I think the questioner is onto something. I think that sanctification is, um, part of it is a shaping of the self around the pattern of Christ, as Paul is writing uh, in his letters. But again, it's not something that becomes utterly self-explanatory to us in this life. It's not something that becomes transparent. So I, I, I think the danger there is thinking, I know exactly what God is doing in me. Now, I know what I'm going to end up like. I'm going to end up l like Christ. But exactly how that happens, I think, uh, is never utterly transparent to me in this life. Thank you. From James. Any thoughts on narcissism as another way of considering the process of identity construction within a market economy? Hmm. That is a really, really interesting question. So Narciss you know, Narcissus, the, um, the, in the ancient myth, looks at himself in the uh, uh, reflection in the water, thinks, what a, what a beautiful person I am. D does he fall into the water and die in the end? Yeah, he does, doesn't he, poor thing? Um, so it's this sense of, of the, the reflecting the self back to the self and, and thinking oneself wonderful and beautiful, I think, is the idea uh, behind this, this, this idea of narcissism. Um, I'm not sure it's as simple as that. I wonder whether the logic of narcissism is actually co-opted in the way that the logic of individuality is in the advert that I had up behind me. So there's a sense in which we are being sold the message that you are relating to yourself and thinking you, yourself beautiful, um, and therefore you are the, the judge of yourself. But actually, the, the criteria for that judgment and the, the space in which that judgment happens is actually a very tightly curated space, both ideological and, and social. And the ways in which we're being catechized to judge ourselves and to think ourselves beautiful are actually, again, commoditized aspects of, of the market. So we think... Um, whether we think this to be a problem or, or a wonderful thing, I am the judge of myself. You know, I'm deciding that I'm beautiful or that I'm not. I, I just wonder whether there's a certain naivety to that because the criteria for that judgment, I don't think it's clear, come from within ourselves. I think we are being catechized to consider certain things beautiful and therefore that logic of narcissism is, is broken open um, by criteria that are coming in from outside. Thank you. From Mark. Luther, when trying to understand his identity before a God, holy God, was told to do what is within you, which led him to a monstrous uncertainty. I assume these are quotes from Luther. He found the objective promises of God gave him an identity outside himself. Was this an example of dispossessive doxological eschatology? Um. It sounds like it, doesn't it? I'm, I'm not familiar with those uh, quotes from Luther, but it, it, it sounds as, as if that's part of the dynamic that's going on. So he looks inside himself, it's just this messed up ball of wool, he can't untangle it, looks outside of himself and gets some sense of who he is. I, I, want, to, I want to perhaps put a rider on that, um, in the sense that, that identity is always constructed in relation to something that is outside of us. So that the, the community around us, for example, you know, this is, again, the, the, the advert, is telling us how to construct our identity. And we all need a community to reflect our identity back to us. We know who we are as we relate to other people and as they either affirm or, or deny or shape or, or sculpt their sense of who we are, we see ourselves reflected in them, so to speak. And so. Identity is, is never, whether it's biblical or, or secular, simply something that you, know, you shut your door of your bedroom and then you work out who you are in, in complete isolation of all social pressures. It's always negotiated in community. But I think the 
the precious thing about a, a biblical identity is that it's negotiated in relation to a God who demonstrated that he has my best interests at heart by dying for me, you know, who paid the ultimate price to show that he is committed to me. Whereas the, the commoditized identity is negotiated in relation to a market that it is very unclear that it has my best interests at heart as an individual, um, and, and for which it seems very likely indeed that other interests are at stake. Uh, and so the, the question, I guess, that, that is raised for all of us at that point is who, which community, uh, which, which way of going outside yourself would you trust most to negotiate your identity, a, a Christ who demonstrates his commitment to you by dying for you, or a market that whatever else it is or isn't, uh, is not unambiguously committed to your best interests uh, as an individual. Thank you. From Elna, with a transforming identity, should there always be continuity? If I look back and felt like my younger self was a different person, is that a natural part of things or is it a problem? <laughs> what a lovely question. Thank you so much for asking it. Um, I can put my philosophy nerd hat on uh, for a moment. This, this is a real problem in philosophy. So that the continuity of, of self, so some people will say, in, in fact, every instant is, is a recreation of the self. Uh, and, you know, people will use examples like, you know, when I was five, when I was ten. You can't say that I'm the same person as I was. Um, they're, they're just that I'm a completely different self. And so some, um, Peter Goldie is, is one example, will, will say that we are different selves. We are many selves throughout our lives. I, I find really compelling the approach to this taken by Paul Ricke, the, the French philosopher, who end, starts off by sort of acknowledging that. He says, yeah, we're not. I'm not the same in the same way that that chair is the same. So the chair is the same in that it's the same stuff over time. He calls it EDEM identity. If I come tomorrow, it's going to be the same stuff as it is today, the same molecules, basically. I mean, it decays gradually, but it's, I know it's the same chair because it's the same stuff. Um, he says, that's not really the case for us. Uh, you know, our bodies renew themselves over time, our cells some of them fall off and some of them grow. And, you know, over time, I, no cell in my body is, is the same as it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So you can't, you can't say that we have this EDEM identity. So what is, what is our identity then? Well, Rico says, we shape our identity according to the making and the keeping of promises. So we, we hold ourselves to certain things over time and that is how we maintain some sort of stable identity. So some of these promises are really trivial. Um, I'll meet you there in an hour, and then we do. Um, and we've created some stability over time in, in terms of our identity. He calls it ipse identity. And, and some promises, of course, are, are more substantial than that. Um, you know, till death do us part. Uh, I am going to hold myself, regardless of how I feel, uh, regardless of my inclinations over time, I am going to keep this promise. Uh, and for Ricoeur, that is foundational to identity. The, both the big promises and the little ones give us a certain stability over time. Think about it. If nobody ever kept a promise, if you never did anything you said you were going to do, the, the sense that, that other people could have of you would be, would be chaotic. Like, who, who is this person? E even in these little micro-promises we make to ourselves. And you can scale this up theologically as well. We know the God of the Bible because he is a God who makes and keeps his promises. That, that is constitutively who he shows himself to be. So it, you know, the promises to Abram in Genesis 12 and so forth. Um, and it, it, it's this biblical idea of faithfulness, the, the God who keeps his promises. Therefore, he is knowable. Therefore, he is not just some sort of chaotic force that might be one thing one day and one thing another day. And so then the knowability of, of God is founded on his faithfulness, the fact that he keeps his promises. And Ricoeur is arguing our sense of self for ourselves and our self for other people is similarly founded on these micro and macro promises to which we hold ourselves over time. So he talks about um, the chair is what it is as a continuity uh, through time, but I am what I am uh, as a I think he says a persistence over time, uh, like a determination to hold myself to something, come what may. 
that's, that's my sense of, of identity. Thank you. There are two questions on the screen and there might be a third one of, that's going to appear, but I think that's, we're going to draw question time to an end after, after this set. There's only two to go. First one from Joe. How individual is self-denial? How does belonging to a Christian community inform our sense of self and our identity? Um, I, I guess belonging to any community will, will shape our sense of who we are. Um, and belonging to a Christian community can do so in a number of ways. I think the first thing to say is that um, Christian communities are not perfect communities, are they? Any of us who are Christians here will readily admit um, that if there were a perfect Christian community, we'd better not join it because we'd be the ones who would ruin it. Um, <laughs> and, and so it's, it's going to be that the, the way in which a Christian community forms me is, is going to be messy because it's full of people like me who are messy uh, and, and who don't always reflect Christ in the way we speak with others and uh, act with others. But one would hope uh, that a Christian community, by and large, over time, uh, would shape people uh, into this, this dynamic of looking to, to Christ and folding him into our sense of who we are. This, you know, this doxological, eschatological dispossession uh, would be, a, a, if you like, a catechetical community, or what James K. A. Smith would call uh, a, a place of, of cultural liturgies, that, that help people to live into, to lean into this distinctively Christian way of living. Now, I'm under no illusions that all churches do that all the time wonderfully, um, but that is surely the ideal of the distinctive way in which a Christian community shapes people should be, I think, that. Uh, but every community shapes us, and the, the more invested we are in it and the longer we spend in it, the more we will be shaped by it. Um, so it's not something that's unique to a Christian community, but I think Christian community should be doing it by God's grace and by the work of his spirit in distinctive ways. Thank you. Jasper, you've just snuck in, um, but first from Mitchell, and these questions are sort of related, I think. While it does sound in theory like the Christian identity isn't commodifiable, we do see Christian beliefs and culture being commodified in practice, whether yeah. it's indulgences, mega churches, or politicians yeah. appealing to Christian voters. Can we really argue that Christian identity isn't commodifiable? Mm. Yeah, good point. Um, look, I think what we can say, and Mitchell, you'll have to, I don't know whether you're in the room or on, on the live stream, but you'll have to decide what, what, what you think about this, is that whenever attempts are made to commodify Christian identity, it cuts against the grain of that identity. Um, but when attempts are made to commodify possessive individualism, possessive identity, it cuts with the grain of those modes of identity formation. So yes, you can do it, um, but I don't think you, I think you lose the authenticity, to the extent that you commodify Christian identity, you defang it, you, you cut it off from what is distinctive about it. And so you end up with some simulacrum of Christian identity, which I think some of the examples that Mitchell was mentioning have done, but you've lost the real thing. You've lost the authenticity of, of this, in a sense, anarchic identity that can't be enclosed within the self because it's open to a God who's infinite and who I can't control and who I can't predict. So you can't, you can't commoditize that, but you can commoditize a simulacrum of it. Thank you. Last question, Jasper. If any identity is within the marketplace, even that of denying an identity, how then can we really deny the self? For if we do so, the self is simply then defined by the denial of the self. Does this not open up a paradox? Oh, you philosophers, you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess um, it's always a risk, isn't it? Uh, it's always a danger that, and, and we we are not always the best judges of this in and of ourselves. And this is why, it, one reason why, I am going to get to the answer, I'm just doing some dancing around before I do that. This is one of the reasons why it's, it's good that identity is formed in community, because sometimes other people can see things about us that we're blind to ourselves and can help us to, to shape our, our, our sense of ourselves in ways that we're unaware of and can often indeed carry us 
when we, we're feeling very fragile about who we are. So there's, there's a sense in which we're not the best judges of this, but there's also, there's always a sense of my very attempt to sort of reach beyond myself to God or to deny myself in order that I might um, find myself in Christ, that that can itself become a self-deceiving gesture that is, that is commoditized, I, I agree. Uh, and this is sort of the dynamic of, of in the book Jeremiah, isn't it? The, the, the heart is deceitful above all things. We're very good at tricking ourselves in this way. You know, look at me, I'm doxologically dispossessed. Isn't that wonderful? You know, whereas all the time we're just, we're just performing gestures that are being co-opted into a, a, a possessive self. And, and that's why I think communities are so helpful because, you know, if, if you're in the sort of church community where people can, can share deep things openly, you know, other people might come up and say, it, it, it seems to me that, that there's something wrong here with, with the way that, that you're, you know, sort of presenting yourself or whatever it is. And, and often it's, it's other people who can see those things in a way that we can't. So it's always a risk. It's always a danger. It's, it's like humility, isn't it? Um, humility is so hard because it's so easy to feel proud about being humble, <laughs> you know. And at the moment, we think, I've got it, I've got humility. Oh, no, bother, I haven't, you know. <laughs> and and it, it's, it's almost like the soap that you're chasing around the bathroom. Whenever you think you've got it, it pops out of your hand again because the, because the moment you think you've got it is the moment you haven't got it, by definition. Um, and, and I think there's a similar thing going on with these dynamics of identity. You know, I am fully doxologically dispossessed, hallelujah, you know, you say to yourself, oh, wait, 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 wait. That's probably a warning sign in and of itself. Um, and other people may be keener observers of that in me than I will be aware of uh, in my own life. Thank you very much. We'll allow you to step down from the stage and- Thank you. I'd like to call on the Bishop of South Sydney, the Right Reverend Dr. Michael Stead, to come and move a vote of thanks. Well, it is my privilege to be able to move a vote of thanks to Christopher tonight uh, for uh, this wonderful night. A, a vote of thanks on behalf of all of you who are in the room and also who are watching online. Uh, for those who were present last night, uh, it was an excellent beginning to a series and tonight has been an equal treat. Um, I don't know if, if we've quite comprehended just how clever tonight was uh, because it's very, very tricky to get the balance right for the second instalment in a trilogy of lectures. If you think about it for a moment, the first in, in a series is pretty easy uh, because in the first lecture you set the trajectory, you excite us about the journey ahead, you, you dangle some tantalising hints that uh, are trying to just let, left hanging for, to, to, to keep us coming back, but it's very clear what you're supposed to do in the first lecture. And likewise in, in the third lecture in, in a series, that's where everything has to come together into a nice, seamless, coherent and satisfying whole. Christopher will be doing that tomorrow night. No, no pressure or anything, but that's, that's the job for tomorrow night. But if you think about it, the second lecture is much harder because at, at the same time, it has to build on what has come before. It has to be part of an overarching mm, sequence or narrative. It's, it's, it's going somewhere. And yet at the same time, it, it has to stand alone it, because there might have been people here tonight who were not here last night. And so it needs to make sense in its own right and not depend on what was said last night. And at the same time, it lead, needs to leave us hanging and wanting more. Uh, that, that tantalising sense of we've got to come back tomorrow night to find out how the story ends. Uh, for me, and this tells you something about my age, and, uh, and I hope this illustration is not lost on most of you as I look around the room, uh, tonight was the perfect Empire Strikes Back. That is, uh, the second part of the trilogy that actually just works in and of itself but is part of that overarching story. Uh, why was tonight so good? 
Uh, for me, it was because uh, Christopher Hales helped us to see the dominant narratives of possessive individualism. Uh, it's helped us to see that it comes to us in three dominant, dominant modes. Uh, the, the primary mode, I guess, the, the one where, that encourages us to embrace that commodified individual to curate ourselves, uh, or, or else to react against that and think that we're bucking against the system and be the radically defined individual who's just like all the other individuals who are pursuing the alternative path. Or, or else, uh, 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 perhaps uh, terribly, to be caught in disorientation and despair, uh, an identity paralysis. Uh, the problem of, of each of those modes of identity is that they all fall apart because they, they can't stand outside themselves to critique themselves. Uh, more importantly, though, than the critique of, of those modes of being, we've also been given an alternative, a biblical alternative, a very, very clumsily framed but beautiful picture of an eschatological, doxological dispossession, a paradox of identity where we find ourselves by losing ourselves. Uh, we, we find self only by losing ourselves to Christ and to his gospel, uh, that we find ourselves only by going outside ourselves in praise. Uh, or, to quote my favourite hymn writer, Wesley, to, when we're, we're found when we are lost in wonder, love and praise. And, and finally, that we can only make sense of the me at this moment in time by not looking at the me at this moment in time, but be looking beyond the moment of time and seeing the eschatological endpoint that shapes the, the, the me on the journey to that destination. That is, it's an identity that's grounded outside itself. Tonight we've been given a picture of a Christian identity that navigates the twin pitfalls of self-assertion and self-abnegation. It's a biblical model that's radically democratic, that is subversively exposing the facade of possessive individualism. It's exhilarating and it's liberating. Who wouldn't want to come back tomorrow night to see how the story's going to end? So can you please join with me in thanking Krista for this second installment? <laughs>